She is professor for art and education at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. She is a feminist cultural theorist, an urban researcher, a curator, and an author. Krosny scholarship addresses questions of ecological and social justice at the present historical conjuncture with a focus on caring practices in architecture, urbanism, and contemporary art. Together with Angelica Fitz, she edited Critical Care, Architecture and Urbanism for a Broken Planet, published in 2019. Um, that is also what this lecture is about. So uh, here is Elke Krasny. Thank you very much for the brilliant uh, introduction and thank you for having me here at uh, Joker Week. I hope I kind of pronounced that correctly, I'm sorry. I would probably have said Joker Week, but uh, I learned it's pronounced differently. I'm really excited. I haven't been speaking in front uh, of real people for a very long time because we are still in pandemic conditions, so I see my students as rectangles um, on Zoom. And, uh, and it feels very different. Uh, when I walked in here and I saw this auditorium, I was like, wow, such a huge space. I can't believe it will be filled. But now there are so many people. It feels um, celebratory to, to speak about very difficult and very complex and very challenging topics that are the topics of our time and the time that lies ahead of us, which we call the future. And I think we will also speak tonight about the um, uncertainty of the time that we call the future and what it has to do with architecture specifically. Be before I go into my presentation, I would like to, to think out loud a little bit about the relation between architecture and the future. Because we could say architects always in a certain way live in the future. They, they engage mostly with things, objects, realities, materialities, buildings that are not there yet. So, so they are designing something um, that is going to be. So we could say that architecture engages in a very specific way in what is to come. Um, when you think back um, to, 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 to the time called modern architecture, um, 20th century, um, they, they promised, um, the architects back then, they promised to build a better future. So, so they were, so I'm not talking about the futuristic times of the 1970s or the 1960s. Um, I'm, I'm still speaking about modern architecture at the, at the, more at the beginning of, of the first half of the 20th century. But I think it carried on also in the second half of the, second se of the 20th century to believe that architects can actually build a better future. That, that was very much a mantra. And it was connected to um, the way in which uh, modernity thought about time, uh, which you're all familiar with. We'll just rehearse it. So it's modern time was the time of progress and the time of development um, and very much a time of um, linearity, a time of growth um, that took the future for granted. And I think your generation is a generation that no longer takes the future for granted in quite the same way that my generation, I was born in 1965, took the future for granted as a time that will always be there. And this is in a way uh, something that we need to address today. What, what is it when we speak about the uncertainty of the future? But I think there's also a very specific relation that we also need to address when we talk about architecture and the future, because it's not only that architects build for the future. In a very specific way, they also build the future. So they were, um, you could say, the profession. I'm not talking about the individuals now. I'm talking about the profession per se. Very much and largely, um, implicated in, in uh, resource extraction, um, in, in using a lot of carbon-rich resources to build um, this modern architecture. And, and so I think it will be um, interesting to see what, what are the lessons learned from this past that maybe we look more critically at today. So there's still a lot to celebrate about modern architecture. I'm not, I'm not, um, not a fan of modern architecture. I, I very much appreciate it and like it, but I think we also need to study it more critically 
in order to understand that the relation to what is already there, to continuing to use buildings, which is what is happening a lot in this part of the world, but also the way in which resources uh, have to be treated uh, more responsibly for there to be a future. And so in a way, critical care architecture and urbanism for a broken planet, even though it has this um, slightly sad title so that the planet is broken, also speaks about um, the future in, 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 in a way that is um, optimistic. So I'm, I'm not giving up on the belief that we can actually collectively create a future. Uh, first, so, so, so this is kind of an overview of what I'll be speaking about today. First, I will uh, speak a little bit about this uh, notion, what it means to live with a broken planet. So a, a planet that is not well, um, climate catastrophic planet. Um, then I will introduce um, notions of care. Um, so, so many of you might have um, an everyday understanding of what care is. Um, so, so there's like two big strands thinking about care. Um, what, one is uh, concerned with ethics and ethical relationships, how we take care of each other how this caretaking um, takes place. And there's another, an other, let's say, historical strand to think about care uh, that uses the term um, social reproduction, which, ca can I just ask you something? Who, who is familiar with this word, social reproduction? Not so many? Okay. <laughs> so so it, it comes uh, out of um, a Marxist feminist um, tradition to to think about uh, the kind of work that is simply put unpaid labor that people do at home. So, so, so you all do social reproduction every day. You, you cook, um, you, you clean your bodies, you wash your clothes, you take care of your architecture, that means you take care of the building you live in. Um, so all these um, activities uh, are mostly unpaid or underpaid or badly paid labor and they're referred to as social um, reproduction. So all the activities that we need uh, in order to reproduce ourselves. And when we get to the second part, I will speak a little bit more about how architecture in my understanding has to do with this care and this social reproduction. And the third part will um, look more closely at how architecture can take care um, of both people and, and the um, environment. Living with a broken planet uh, is, is very much at the forefront of um, environmental concerns, um, but also um, social injustices that are connected to the way in which different um, parts of the globe, but also different parts of cities are implicated in the climate catastrophe. Um, so, so broadly speaking, we could say that the global south is much more affected by climate catastrophe than the global north. There are exceptions to this. I'm saying it's, it's, it's broadly speaking. But then we could also, when we look at our own cities, begin to understand that um, waste um, uh, management or toxicity is not evenly spread. So there is a correlation between um, poverty and being exposed to uh, environmental toxicity. And this is something we can use as a lens in order to understand that spatial injustices, injustices social injustices and environmental injustices are actually linked with each other. And the second big word that I used here is the word interdependency. So, so you might all uh, be very familiar with the term independence. So, so that, that human beings, and that's again a very modern idea, are autonomous or independent subjects. And that is very much something that as a political philosophy was uh, something that modernity aspired to. So how can people become independent human beings? On the other hand, and we also talked a little bit before about uh, social reproduction, we all know that we are always dependent upon others. We are dependent um, in the way we 
need food, nourishment, love, health care. So all the things that actually allow for us to live and to survive, and I only named a few of them, they, they clearly tell us that we can not live without being linked to others. So they depend upon us and we depend upon them. And this is uh, what is being referred to as interdependency. And some are more dependent upon others than others. So some need more help at certain moments in their lives and others less. So we can think that over a lifetime, when, when human beings are very young, when they are babies, they are, they are more or less completely dependent upon others. And, and when people move close towards dying, many of them, again, are very dependent upon others. So, so this is just to simplify it, but then we can think about this in a much more complex way. But just to, to make understood, when you think about architecture and interdependency, some bodies will need more support than others uh, when they live in architectural um, environments. And how to think about these interdependencies um, when we put architecture into this and not just human beings is what I'm interested in vis-a-vis -vis living with a planet that is not um, well, a planet that has been damaged by human beings. I put together some, um, some literature and, and it's a very um, small selection of, of books that, that are of interest to the theme. And I shared the slides with, with um, Eve, so I mean they can be shared with, with the students who are interested in it in case um, someone wants to, to have the slides to, to um, revisit literature or, or quotes or whatever. So, so the books I put here are, um, two are by, um, written by journalists, um, science journalists, and one is written by a scholar. Elizabeth Colbert is a um, science journalist and she has written on the sixth extinction and not unnatural history. So, so we are currently living in a period that is called the sixth mass extinction. There were five such extinction events uh, previously, so we are talking geological time, like long, long, long time ago. Uh, the, the difference um, with this sixth extinction is that human beings have a role in it. So, so the fact that um, so many species are disappearing currently and are on the verge of being or becoming extinct has to do with the um, impact uh, on the planet's atmosphere and climate that um, the so-called Anthropocene has caused. So this book offers examples of species that are on the verge of disappearing and also explains um, human implication in it. The book in the middle um, by Rob Nixon, who uh, was born in South Africa, um, is now a scholar and educator based in the United States of America, is called Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. And he investigated um, environmental activism from the global south, mostly um, uh, the African continent, to inscribe um, an environmental resistance uh, against um, toxicity, garbage dumping, but also the oil, the mega oil industry that, that um, destroyed large swaths uh, of Africa in order to bring to the fore that, it, that there is a long tradition to fight um, global petrocapitalism um, that, that is not coming from, from this part of the world. And the last book uh, here is called The Uninhabitable Earth, so very similar to, to The Broken Planet. Life After Warming by David Wallace Wells, and it's very approachable. It's, it's also written by um, a science journalist, and, um, and he starts out in the first chapter describing that he was very skeptical of, of something called climate change. He didn't really believe that the climate is changing and that there is human implication in it.
and that led him to research, investigate, look at a lot of scientific material and digest it in a way that people who are not natural scientists like me can actually read it, relate to it, and, and make sense of, of the time we are living in. So it's just recommendations for literature I want to share tonight. Um, the next three books um, I selected to share are slightly different, uh, but also um, not, not heavily philosophical. So they are also written in a way that, uh, and I also want to underline that. I, I, I find it very important to share literature um, with, with students and with interested audiences um, that manage to write in a language that is not obscure. Um, in a language that is actually, um, I wouldn't say easy, but approachable, that, 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 that helps us to understand complexity. Um, and explaining complexity in, in a way that um, can help us understand that things are complex in, without making them um, more opaque uh, or impenetrable, I think is something that, that has um, to be appreciated. Uh, Caroline Merchant is an um, environmental philosopher and thinker, and this book is really old. It was written in the early 1980s. It's called The Death of Nature, Women, Ecology, and the Scientific Revolution. My mother language is German. I live in Vienna. It was just translated into German, so 42 years later, uh, which also tells us something about the way in which uh, things that were actually being understood in the 1980s, that the climate is changing, that it has something to do with moderni modernization, modernity, industrialization, with, with the way in which um, after the scientific revolution, after the invention of the steam engine, humans began to change the surface of the planet. And, and this is one of the early investigations where she looks at um, the specific connection between women, ecology, the scientific revolution, and what it did to nature. So that in a certain, so what death here means is on one hand, similar to the broken planet, that large parts of nature are dying. But she also talks about this in a more philosophical manner, that um, before the, the Western scientific revolution, Gaia or the Earth was considered to be a living being, an organism. And um, Western science has transformed the planet into something that can be studied, cataloged, categorized um, um, with indexes and encyclopedias something that can be transformed scientifically, but also made easier for what we call extraction, so for the extraction of resources. And the next two books that are um, here, Clean and, and White, A History of Environmental Racism and From the Ground Up, are both concerned with the context of the United States of America, and they look at connections between um, histories of pollution, one could say, um, and, and um, big factories um, rendering the, um, the ground toxic and, and uninhabitable, but also damaging water or the air, and how this is unevenly um, distributed and has a lot of impact along um, racial lines and, and, and racial divides um, historically. I don't think there's quite the same amount of critical research on, on European territories on this uh, specific um, angle of investigating environmental racism. That's why I chose these titles here. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to learn differently if I overlook the literature. It can also have to do with the, with the limitations of, of language as to what um, I can read. Um, this um, is, is the last bibliographical uh, reference I'm, I want to give uh, on, on living with a broken planet. It's uh, written by Anne Karp. She uh, teaches creative writing uh, in London and um, and, and also writes in a very um, journalistic manner. And uh, I, I bought this book last summer. So, so I was in the Netherlands with my family on vacation and I went to a bookstore 
I honestly, at home, I wouldn't have bought a book called How Women Can Save the Planet. I, I would have thought, well, you know, why do women now have to save the planet? So, so first, everything is broken by patriarchy, and now, now we have to save the planet, so I'd rather, I'd rather not. But, but then I, there weren't that many books to choose from in, in English. So, and so I started looking at it, and then I was extremely intrigued. Um, what she's investigating is how there are stories of climate change that impact largely on women's lives that one wouldn't even see, and I'm coming to an example in a minute, but also how women organize in order to create, I would say, self-organized, self-built, and self-reliant infrastructures to not be impacted as badly by climate change as they would be otherwise. So she describes, for example, that um, um, a, a lot of women who didn't have access to information um, on changing weather conditions or coming catastrophes on the Fiji Islands organized in order to set up information systems so, so that they can have access and warn each other. Um, so that would be an example of how to prepare. And preparedness is, is one of the, the words that all of you have learned during the pandemic. So how are we actually prepared? I mean, currently we are not looking at preparedness. Currently we are at, at witnessing a war where the budgets go toward uh, military um, spending and not preparing better for um, environmental or pandemic catastrophes. So one of the examples she describes, and it has to do with architecture, but also with climate change and, and with women um, having to leave their villages. So, so I'll explain it. Um, the Bangladesh is, is, as you all know, one of the countries with um, um, a huge... I, am I doing something wrong for this? Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll try to do it better. So um, um, Bangladesh is a textile producing uh, country, also one of the countries uh, most impacted by climate change um, and flood catastrophes. And Rana Plaza was one of the um, textile factory collapses that, that was reported uh, worldwide. Uh, so global um, companies like Benetton um, had cheap labor in, in, in this huge building. And it hadn't been, we talked about maintenance before, it hadn't been maintained properly. So nobody invested in caring for the building. So it, it became very dangerous and, and it actually collapsed. And thousands of people um, died in, in this um, collapse. But the reason why they actually, why these women and mostly women textile workers come to work there is that um, the, the land on which their families farm or, or have houses is, is actually under threat from floods. And therefore it's very diffic difficult for them to get married and to find husbands because they cannot um, have the dowry or, or the, the money or the prospect of having a home and, and agricultural land at their disposal in the future. So they're actually, you could say, internal climate refugees. So climate refugee is not yet a legal term, but, but they are displaced. And then they have to move to, um, to work elsewhere. So I think here we see a very um, complex situation, how climate change affects individuals' lives, but it also has to do with uh, looking at architectural history differently. So we could say telling the story of this factory could enter architectural history, but I would say conventionally such a story is not part of the architectural histor historical narrative or canon. But I think when we start looking at stories like this, we, we understand the responsibility for architecture differently. How, um, and that's not necessarily the responsibility of architects, that's not what I'm saying, but to understand 
that architecture needs to be maintained in order to give the kind of support. I'm really sorry. Um, in order to give the kind of support. Uh, yeah, you can take the phone. Um, so hopefully now it will all be better. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and this is just to, to show um, the, the flood situation in two images. And um, Anne Karp quotes um, um, an article by George Black, your clothes were made by a Bangladeshi climate refugee, which is also her first point of reference in order to make understood that um, factory work and, um, and um, the climate situation, um, they are interconnected, they have to do with each other. So I think looking at objects of architecture in a more complex way is what I tried to introduce in, in the beginning and what they have to do with what we call a broken planet, the inhabitation of, um, of brokenness on many levels, uh, the, the brokenness of the environment, but also uh, the brokenness of much of, of existing architecture that is not maintained properly. Um, in 2000 and a long time ago, in 2015, so that's seven years ago, I, I started to think about um, the, the concept of, of care and, and feminist care ethics um, in trying to understand how one can relate um, care ethics to, um, to architecture. So care ethics comes uh, from a feminist uh, tradition of, of thinking and, and pushed back against abstract morals. So, so if you think abstract morality, that, that would be Kant and so on and so forth. Uh, but when we think about ethics, they are, they are always concrete. They are relational, as we say. So, so like your relation to another human being, or my relation to my cat, or my relation to not eating meat, uh, or all our relation to the atmosphere. So all these relations are also ethical relations. And um, the, the very practical um, decisions that, that we make every day, like what we consume, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the houses we live in, they have they are not only material, they also have ethical consequences. And, and so uh, thinking about ethics in, in a more, let's say, material way than just about interpersonal relationships is when I started to become interested in how to relate care ethics as a political theory um, to, to architecture and architecting. In a, in a very simple way, when you go back to, to architectural theory like ancient, like Vitruve and Alberti, you can dig out quotes which I did for the essay that I wrote in the critical care book to which I will come, um, that, that architecture is always um, care, providing care from the weather, from, from the cold, from the sun, making it possible for people to actually um, um, regenerate and, and have s protected sleep and, and a protected environment. So we could say on a very basic level, architecture is a form of care, but it, so the phone wasn't it. But even though it's easily understood that, that architecture provides care and protection, historically architecture wasn't considered care. And architects weren't considered care workers. So when we think about care workers, we think about nurses and, and maybe school teachers um, and, and others who take care of mostly human bodies. But, but we would never have called um, a historical architect uh, a care worker or a care provider. And I think today with our climate catastrophic, uh, catastrophic condition, it, it makes a lot of sense to think about architects providing care to um, humans, to human life, but also, maybe I'm 
I'm sorry because it must be terrible on your ears. <laughs> Okay. And I'll try to hold it um, so that it won't do that. Um, so CARE can provide um, a framework uh, for analysis, for theory, but also for practice. So when you think about uh, analysis, you could say, well, does this building take a good job to take care of students and their needs? Does it provide an environment that is good for teaching and for learning and for having breaks? So I think we can take this in a very practical way. Uh, we can also look at this in a, in a bit more theoretical way. What, what are the ethical and political implications? And um, coming from where I come from in Vienna, I, I, I teach at the Academy of Fine Arts, the building where I teach, which is a Theophil Hansen building. He was a Danish architect. He also built uh, the Art Academy in Athens, and uh, so he was one of the star architects at the time. But what I want to say is the building um, was um, very much um, appropriated and co-opted by the Nazi regime, and they put Hitler busts there and things like that. So, so I would say when, when we have to take care of what a building was used for, we also have to, to know the histories we are implicated in. So, so I think it's, it has larger theoretical um, ramifications, which, which I won't go deeply into today. I, I just wanted to mention them. And then the last thing is, is practice. And I think this is where it matters as a um, prefiguration. How will I uh, think about the care that my building will give to others, uh, but also to the planet? Um, so again, I, I won't go long into the literature. Um, I'm a big fan of, of Joan C. Tronto. She is um, a political theorist and, and feminist ethicist. She used to teach at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and she retired two years ago. And um, the, the shortest essay is the book in the middle. It's called Who Cares? And it was actually a lecture in which she um, explains how she approaches care as a, as a political framework. Oops, I'm sorry. And uh, together with Berenice Fischer, who already died, um, she established these steps of caring. And I think even though she really talked about caregivers and care receivers in a medical context or in the context of children and their parents, it's useful to adapt this framework to think about architecture. And the most difficult thing is how to align what we care about with how we care for it. So I think that's the most challenging step. So we care about means um, something we want to happen. So we want our buildings to be sustainable, beautiful, lasting, not resource extractive, intersectional, uh, being open to all genders. Um, not discriminating against anyone, accommodating to uh, bodies that are not able-bodied. So we could think a lot about the things that we care about. But then the next step is how do we actually get there? How do we care for this to become a material, spatial uh, reality that can be financed, that finds a client, uh, that can be uh, persuasive so that the client actually wants to build it? So I think we can use this framework to, to think in very practical terms about making and designing architecture. The last two things, care giving and care receiving, I, I like to think from the perspective of the building itself. So, so what kind of care does a building give? And, and how does the building receive care? How is it being maintained so that it can actually give care? So, so we have this kind of reciprocal relationship. The last uh, step, which was added by Tronto later, so not in her first essay, which she wrote in 1991, but only more recently in 2013, is care with. And this is her democratic approach to care that care is something that should be shared um, equally, but that should also be uh, distributed more equally over society, so that there is not what David Graeber, the, the late uh, anarchist anthropologist, called the caring classes and the 
care less classes or the care free classes, but but that care is actually shared in 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 more um, yeah more evenly. This is their um, definition, <coughs> and um, I think you can just read it. I will not read it out loud. The second sentence I think is particularly interesting to uh, look at through the lens of architecture. So when they write that this world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, then, then this is precisely what architecture does, what it does, between our bodies and our environment. So we could say architecture impacts both our physical but also our mental and affective and, and emotional being but also our environment locally but also in a planetary way. And the last uh, section um, of this um, lecture today is um, caring architecture, so, so architecture that provides uh, forms of care and then thinking about uh, architecture as a verb, as a doing, so like to, so it doesn't exist, but, but to architect, so to, to actually um, not think about um, d design um, or building, but to think these things together, so how architecture comes into the world, um, that's what I would like to call architect, architecting, and how this process of architecting can actually produce um, care, caregiving. So this is the dictionary definition. Um, so architecture is the art and science of designing and erecting buildings. But it also, so it's, it's what you do, it's what you think of. We talked about that at the beginning. It always relates to the future. It's, it's the art and science of designing something that will be erected, that will be there in the future. Um, but it is also the result of it. So architecture also means the objects, not only the process of thinking it, but also the, um, the buildings and, as the dictionary describes, other large structures. So, so we have to, to think about care in both ways. Care when people design, so, so what do they care about and how do they care for it. And when we did the critical care exhibition, uh, we invited, or I invited Joan Tronto to write um, an article for the book. And she's not an architectural theorist, but I invited her to look at architecture from a care ethicist standpoint. And in this essay she writes, it's not that architects don't care, they do care, but maybe very often in the past they did care about the wrong things. They cared about fame or about money or about making a larger tower. Um, so you can, you know, you can think of your own examples, but, but we can care for things that are meaningful in one way and we can care um, about other things that may not be so meaningful when we think about the climate catastrophe we, we are living in today. Um, so, so when we think about what, what, what architecting does, what does architecture actually um, build, then I think it's very important that we never forget that architecture builds a lot more than just a building. It builds structures of support, of enablement, and of care, so that we are actually supported, that we can actually do things, that we can actually um, have infrastructures, large infrastructures, but also small infrastructures that, that support us in our daily lives, but also in um, activities that are not so daily, like we could think here of um, cultural activities or spiritual activities, or leisure activities that also are supported by structures. Architecture, and I think this is the, the second, what I'm reading now, architecture builds structures of domination, representation and control. That's much more how architecture has been theorized. So it has a very Michel Foucauldian angle to it, what I wrote here. To understand, you can think about the prison and the hospital that, that were the um, exemplary um, structures that Michel Foucault used uh, in order to make understood that architecture enacts power and discipline. 
and forces people and bodies to behave in certain ways. And this is, of course, very important to understand and to analyze. Um, we have to understand how architecture is implicated in, in dominating and subjugating people. Um, we can think about what we contemporarily call the carceral um, complex. But we can also think about other forms of control that are enacted through architecture and other devices. We can think about the door, the door that opens, but also the door that closes on us, the door that only some people can get through and others not, and how the door together with other technologies, like at my university at the moment, we can only go in if we have a green pass or uh, if we are exempt from, from uh, needing to be vaccinated because we suffer from some kind of in, immune sufficiency. So, so we have to prove that we can actually go in. So it's not the architecture alone, it's also the social production of architecture around it. And I think representation is also pretty clear to all of you, how architecture symbolizes or represents um, the power um, of the parliament or of rulers or of monarchs or of um, emperors or of churches. Um, so, so we can think of a lot of representational functions that architecture has. I think that architectural history and theory was less interested in studying what I wrote in the first sentence. So I, I wouldn't know of by heart architectural an architectural history book that tells me how architecture actually supported and enabled and cared for people in the past. So there wasn't this critical, let's say, passion um, at the time when Michel Foucault wrote his books in the 1970s and 1980s to actually look at the other side, at the caring side of architecture. And I don't want to s this to sound naive. I think it is extremely important to understand how architecture can care or can be careless. Because once we understand that architecture cares, we can also understand better how architecture becomes careless and doesn't provide care. So which systems has architecture, oh, there's an E missing, has architecture built? So this is a question to think about. We, we are not, no, no, no single person can answer this. All these questions here are, are questions to be answered collectively which realities under the conditions of these systems has architecture built? Because architecture always builds. I mean, architecture is the profession that doesn't go on strike, right? Or do they? Do they go on strike? Not so often. So I think there have been architects who participate in other strikes and in other social movements and are very let's say, activist. But as a profession, I think architecture rarely goes on strike. And ar architects also don't go on. So in my country, there are architects, they built for the Austrofascism, then they built for the Nazi regime, then they built for the reconstruction. So they built for every regime there is. And, and they were very good to be um, in a good rapport with each regime. And it's not just like this in my country. It's like this in many countries around the globe. So, so architecture and architects who design that architecture is very much implicated in systems. So, so they don't only build the future, they also um, are relevant to building specific systems like capitalism, socialism, communism, fascism, and so on and so forth. And architecture has been built on, and we talked about that briefly before, exploitation and extraction regardless of the system. So I think today it's oversimplifying to say that only capitalism extracted from the planet. Um, the, 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 the former East um, was also highly implicated in extraction. So, so it's more complicated than just um, a one-sided capitalist history of extraction. Um, are, are you all familiar with the Anthropocene? so we don't have to really explain that term. Because a couple of years ago, that would have been very different. So, so in 2015, 2016, people weren't so familiar. I will explain it very briefly so that the ones who know a lot are not too bored and the ones who don't know so much yet get a, a little bit of an understanding. 
So in, 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 in the year 2000, um, two uh, atmospheric uh, chemists, uh, Krutzen and Sturmer, they, they published um, a very um, short essay in which they suggested that we are entering into a new geological era. So geological time periods are massive and, and they don't get a new name very often. So for the better part of my life, I thought I lived in the Holocene, but I never thought about it. I mean, I never even knew that I lived in the Holocene, like actively or consciously. So in 2000, they suggested that the impact of human beings on planet Earth has been so disastrous that humans have become um, an atmospheric and um, geological force. And those two, Krutzen and Sturmer, argue that the beginning of the Anthropocene is the invention of the steam engine. There are other geologists and, and atmospheric chemists who argue other beginnings of the Anthropocene. But let's, for today, just stick with, um, with the steam engine. And um, the term was chosen to refer to um, Anthropos, which is an um, um, ancient Greek word. And it means, um, it actually means man, but it, it's supposed to mean all human beings. So, so like in French, where, where the word l'homme also is supposed to include all genders, but it's actually um, gendered male. So um, the Anthropocene um, migrated from um, geology in a very fast way. It became very, you could say, popular. Uh, with the humanities, with the arts, um, with social sciences, also within architecture. Uh, there, there have been books edited on architecture in relation to the Anthropocene. So it has very much um, captured, um, you could say, the imagination and also um, our consciousness in a certain way. And um, I, I, I speak more of the broken or damaged planet than of the Anthropocene, but this is the time period we are speaking of. And, and when we think about uh, care and architecture, we also have to think about the historical implication of architecture's implicatedness, so that architecture was built on um, steel and glass and a lot of materials that are very um, carbon rich. And um, what I wrote here under the implications of architecture's implicatedness is in a way a, a kind of a timeline. So the, the Anthropocene dating back to the steam engine can also be uh, correlated with what is called the birth of enlightenment men. Um, there is um, a very famous anthropologist, her name is Anna Tsing. She has written this wonderful book about the mushroom at the end of the world. And she um, speaks about enlightenment man, and she writes man with a capital M to say it's a very specific man that is responsible for the Anthropocene, not all human beings in the same way. But man, think back to the death of nature, man who thought um, that nature can be exploited, dominated, subjugated, and so on and so forth. And the modern architect as we know it today, like architects with a systematic education, uh, were actually invented in the same time period. So in the year of 1794-95, um, the Ecole Nationale Supérieure uh, for Architecture opened in Paris. It took them 176 years to admit women, so a long time. So mostly they educated men and, and architects like others, like um, scientists or engineers were the model citizens. So the modern architect is very close to the birth of enlightenment men and, and also um, the whole Anthropocene history. And this was very much based on the notion that humans are exceptional, which is also a modern idea. So it means exceptional as they are different from nature, different from all the other living beings. So that's called human exceptionalism. And this is an idea that dates back to, to this um, Enlightenment steam engine period. And um, we could say, in other words, uh, human exceptionalism dominating nature and building in an extractivist way has to do with capitalist colonial extractivism and what I introduced earlier per Caroline Merchant, the death of nature. <laughs> 
And so when we think about the history of architecture, and I, I really speak about history like history is till yesterday. I mean, so I, I don't speak about history like it happened hundreds of years ago. The history of architecture, I, I would argue, cannot be a question of styles. I mean, it's important to understand what styles stand for and how they are representative of systems and so on and so forth. But they, they, they are not helpful in order to learn how architecture can give care. I mean, not very helpful. Um, and the history of architecture can also not be a history of just masters to which we then add mistresses. Um, telling the history of architecture differently will help envision a different future for architecture. And this is what I'm saying. I'm not an architect. So this is what I'm saying as a, as a cultural theory person and curator. So this is what I think a contribution to architecture can be by people who are not necessarily all architects. So I think the history of architecture can also not be told exclusively by architects alone. And all this to say that uh, uh, critical care architecture for a broken planet was Angelica's and my um, like contribution to thinking about architecture at this moment in time when uh, climate change was, was and is very um, urgent. But I think, of course, with the pandemic and now with the ongoing war, there are more urgencies. And, and they all have to do with architecture. This wasn't um, the theme of the, tonight's lecture. But when you think about architecture in relation to the pandemic, and when you think about uh, what we see every night um, or every morning or at all hours, what, what is happening in, in the Ukraine and how buildings are purposefully destroyed, then, then we understand that there is a war against architecture in order to wage a war against human beings who then don't have any protection. Um, th this is an installation view uh, when the exhibition traveled from Vienna from the Architecture Center to Berlin to the um, uh, German Architecture Center. So I'm just showing a few images here. Oh, this is the project you like, right? Um, so we can say architecture is the built archive of power, but it's also the built archive of care. And I think we have to understand them as to be interrelated. So care can be very terrible. So, so there are um, indigenous people in, in, uh, in Canada who would say, I survived care, like state care that was imposed on me. But we also have to understand power in a more nuanced way. Power also means agency to be able to act. So, so I don't want to say one is good and the other is evil. Th they are both both. Um, and now I will finally share some, um, some of the, very few, some of the projects that we included. Um, this is um, Cesc Pompeia in, in Sao Paulo. And it used to be a, a department store, um, 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 a concrete uh, and steel structure from the 1950s that was more or less um, hollowed out, um, and but but kept. The structure was kept, and and now it's uh, it's it's one of the many um, sesks. So sesk is. Um, so it's a Portuguese acronym, and it stands for all the, um, um, all the entities that have to do with tourism and trade. And since 1946, they have like a welfare mechanism. So 1% so of all the incomes generated are used for the general good or for welfare or for the public good. And, um, and so they invested in uh, infrastructures. So uh, an other sesk that you might know is Bailina Bobardi in Sao Paulo. The, the other sesks, like there are 40 in Sao Paulo alone, haven't um, entered the architectural canon. And, uh, and this here has um, a pool on the rooftop that very much functions like a public space, you could say. A lot of the houses around here, so, so I visited it in 2000 and um, 17. Uh, a lot of the houses around here are squatted uh, by um, refugees, mostly from the African continent, and they also come and use the sesk. So, so it's it's there is very low um, security. I mean, there is security, but it is like uh, I would say it's an interior public space. 
and it's a very important space for the neighborhood in, in downtown Sao Paulo. Paulo Mendes da Rocha, he won, he won the Pritzker Prize, as, as you might know, and MMBB architects are four architects, like they call them younger, <laughs> but I mean they're younger compared to him, so he's like 90. Uh, maybe a little over 90, and, and they are like my age. And they had a collaboration for this um, SESC uh, 24 Mayo. Um, this is uh, an, an, an infrastructure f uh, in a refugee camp so that uh, children can, can go to school and, and can have an environment uh, where they can study, uh, done by emergency architecture and human rights. Um, and they uh, managed to, to build 100 classrooms for refugee children. So I think uh, there is a lot of discussion around um, first aid or relief architecture, like instant first aid, and then to think how can these structures become more long-term? How can they be sustained? How can they um, provide what, what they are? Um, when refugee camps become um, long-term, also the structures they are need to be better at providing um, what is needed. Um, Yasmin Lari, Heritage Foundation of Pakistan, the Sin Flood Rehabilitation ongoing since 2010. So that's one of the projects that, that um, I, I'm extremely interested in. I've just been in Pakistan in February doing more research on her work. She is a, so Yasmin Lari is the first female architect in Pakistan. She started practicing the year I was born, so it's easy for me to remember. And she um, is now a little over 80 and, and she stopped working as an architect in the early 21st century. So, so she said, I retired from business as usual. And after that, um, in 2005, there was the, um, um, the big earthquake in Pakistan, 7.6 on the, on the Richter um, scale. Uh, she started um, to use her architectural knowledge in order to, to rebuild and to work with villages that were most affected. So the poorest of the poor, that's how she describes it. And after the, the, Sindh, um, the big flood in, in the Sindh region, which is the region around Karachi, um, she started to, to work toward um, zero carbon self-building. And uh, there have been like 45,000 uh, houses built, like the two you see here, and, and they're all self-built. So she invests very much in training, mostly women, but also men, to, to become builders themselves. So it's, it's in a way a very complex system. Um, complex in the sense that, that you need a lot of um, labor power in order to provide the training and, and to teach people. And the interesting thing that happened during the pandemic is that they started using digital technology in new ways um, and distributing architectural knowledge for free um, via <laughs> Zoom, which is not, which is also evil. But um, but so I mean, they use these technologies in new ways, and I find it very interesting how she bridges, you could say, vernacular traditions, um, zero what she calls zero carbon materials and new technologies. So so there is a very interesting weaving together. Um, also how to work with people who are mostly illiterate and, and then use technologies in order to uh, communicate knowledge. And this is one of the teaching sessions pre-pandemic, so when it was still done in, in real life. Um, this is one of the traditional um, stoves. You might be more familiar with them in the context of India, where they have been written about a lot that they cause um, CO2. Um, and so she innovated these stoves in, in a number of ways. So A, she elevated the platforms that, that uh, there is something like a larger, almost public space that people can sit and be together. But of course, it also works for cooking. Um, so she talks about dignity, so that, that women no longer sit on the ground when they cook, but that it's also a more communal space. And she also innovated um, the, the, and reduced um, the amount of wood needed for heating these stoves. 
Well, how are we doing time-wise? I think you all look really tired. Okay, so I'll I'll be really I'll, I'm almost I'm almost there. So uh, the the community land trust in uh, in the um, in Puerto Rico in in San Juan is is not a project that really has so much to do with architects building something new. It's more to do with architects, anthropologists, lawyers, uh, and others working together. So the land on which the informal city, which you see in the foreground, um, was actually <coughs> transferred into a community land trust in perpetuity, that means forever. So the, the land can no longer be sold. It belongs to the entire community um, who lives there and they, c they cannot sell individual lots. And when you look at the um, um, buildings in the background, that's the financial district, which is encroaching on the informal city that um, started to be developed uh, in, the 19, um, in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And the land value has extremely risen in, in the last decades because of the um, encroachment of the financial district. And so in order to um, prevent uh, dispossession and, and eviction, um, this land trust was created. Before that happened, there was a huge environmental um, repair project along the Martin Peña Canal, which, so, so in a way, of course, environmental repair is very much needed. So, so cleaning up, um, preventing open sewage, um, making the river um, cleaner again. But, but sometimes environmental repair also leads to land becoming more valuable. And, and those who lived there before are no longer being able to actually enjoy that there has been environmental repair. So there were two, um, let's say, two fronts against which um, the Community Land Trust uh, initiative uh, pushed back. And they were successful, so this law was actually implemented. Uh, and this is one of the community leaders. Um, so, so in terms of um, curating, the material that we collected came from very different sources. And you could also see that it wasn't um, architectural photography like you may usually see it in exhibitions. It, it wasn't glossy. It wasn't glossy photography, um, and and a lot of it came from um, activists, but also from architects themselves who hadn't hired um, Ivan Bahn to take a photograph. Um, so I think when we think about uh, architecture and care, we have to ask very deep, but also very everyday questions. Which homes will we survive in? Which environments will we survive in? And which environments will architecture create when these homes and other buildings are being created? And we also need to ask, what does architecture respo respond to? How do architectural responses work towards social and ecological change? And how can architecture, as a form of care, practice social and ecological justice? The responsibility of architecture at the present historical conjuncture, so that's a big word to say now. I mean, it's, it doesn't mean anything else, but present historical conjuncture just means now, in today, of ecological, social, and pandemic catastrophe. And responsibility written like that is borrowed from um, the feminist uh, philosopher uh, and thinker Donna Haraway. She, she takes these two words apart. So response, how to respond to something, uh, and ability. And when you just hear it, it sounds like responsibility. So, so being responsible. But it, it also means that we have to be able to respond. The responsibility of architecture. How can and will architects and architecture respond to present day conditions on a neoliberal, neoliberal capitalism based on the resource extraction and labor exploitation. So, so it's a huge question. And, and it's not a question that a single architect can solve. Um, and, and I think this is also saying something about the state of the profession. So, so, so that the profession needs to become transformed in such a way that there is more of a collective understanding what architects do. 
and not the, the individualist hero fighting um, continuation. Architecture is best understood through an approach based on the idea of ecologies. And ecologies are systems of relationships based on the interdependencies of living and non-living entities. And so how do we get from future to futurity? So futurity means that there actually is a future. So that a future can be, that the future will exist. And I think uh, the, the word underneath sounds really big, planetary responsibility, but it always starts local. So, so, so ev ev every square, whatever, <laughs> meter on the, on, on the planet is local, but also planetary. So I think when we think about responsibility, it's all the things that, that make up the planet when we think about this. And, um, and with this really big, big word, I, I, I would like to close and, and I hope we can have um, questions, critique, um, comments, thoughts um, and engage um, a bit more. Interesting lecture. Um, if anyone has questions or critique or wants to add something, um, you can raise your hand. Um, so you talk about care and about the architect has to care, and then you show these examples of uh, times where the architect still built for clients who didn't care, like fascists. Um, how do we deal with non-caring clients as an architect? Because you say we never go on strike. So how do we solve this problem? I mean, I think there's a big, <coughs> so, so there's like, it, it's not, so I'm not saying all architects should go on strike. That's not what I was calling for. I think what I was trying to say is that um, one also has to learn I mean, from my perspective, you know, it's not prescriptive. But it is important to understand what we say no to. Um, so, so nobody forces people to build for oligarchs or evil petro-capitalists. So, so naively, one could say, if all architects uh, were to say, well, you know, for these people, not as individuals, but, but what they do to the planet, we just don't design for them. Our services are not there for them. That would be a way of organizing uh, within architecture with, that I would find extremely political. So that's a little <coughs> bit different than going on strike, like in the sense of going um, to strike on March 8th and not uh, doing any reproductive labor for a day. That's more withholding services. Um, so, and, and I think this means that maybe to step back, um, how much do we know about clients? I mean, how, how much time do architects actually invest in finding out what their clients stand for, what, <coughs> what they do, what they produce? And I think this needs to be understood better. And I wouldn't say that all clients are careless, by no means, that's not what I was saying. But I think to, un to get a better understanding who and what and how and why and and not be driven by this okay we have to pay the rent we have to earn money yeah that for sure but it but it doesn't mean that we have to give in to everything that's what i was trying to say yeah but this question was mostly because the project you showed you had like a client who cared so that's why i was uh, asking for maybe examples of how to deal in like times of period where the client is non caring for example under fascism what that what the profession then could do in that time yeah that's a really um i mean how could we prevent fascism i mean that's that's a really good question um i don't think architects alone can do it but i think they would have a very important uh, role to play um in in that um I think it's a, it, it's, it's a really, really good question. And I think being able to ask that question is the first step to understand wh what, what is at stake. 
politically when when one builds? I think you gave the answer, so that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Thank you. Well, wait, that's it first. <laughs> so uh, I have a question about the part uh, with activism uh, in architecture and how it is, isn't grounded in different systems like uh, capitalism, communism and so forth. You said that there aren't much projects that include activism uh, within architecture, I think, or did I understand that uh, incorrectly? Or Okay. Uh, am I wrong or? Okay, okay. So no, I just had a thought. Uh, isn't it because there is less funding within arch architectural activism that are that there are not many buildings or projects in process that include activism? Uh, because I think there are many ac architects that want to include this in their projects, mm -hmm. but can't uh, because their clients don't support these things. So, yeah, I just want to hear your thoughts about it. So I think it relates to the first question, and maybe we can come ah, yeah. back to, mm -hmm. because you were not happy with the answer. I mean, so, it was, uh, so, um, so, so, I, so I think architectural activism, I think, is not something that, that that just manifests in marches. I mean, that's not what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. I think building <coughs> activism means to be um, resistant and um, insistent, I would say. So both, you have to resist certain things, but you also have to insist over a long period of time. And and I think this is the hard thing to do. So, so when you think about an an architectural career over 50 years to actually insist on all the things that you do not want to do every day, I think this will be the hard part, um, not, not to go out and organize a march. And I guess the other thing you were talking about is that there is no space for activism because of client-driven um, conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think, again, there are many answers to that. So, so on one hand, we could say there are examples where, where architects become developers. I mean, so where they try to, to set the conditions um, of the means of production in, in Marxist terms, so, so that, that they actually um, become developers themselves. It's not necessarily what I would argue for, but I think it is a very interesting and, and feasible um, model. Uh, I think the, the much uh, harder thing to do is um, work with clients in such a way that the, what we call communication can become a two-way communication in order to, to actually um, bring these concerns um, that we were just speaking about um, to, to the perspective that a client can also share. So to invest in something that is not for immediate <coughs> profit. And I think this is much harder to do. So this is like mm -hmm. the, the everyday activism uh, where, where the tools one needs uh, go beyond architecture per se. I think they would need to include um, communication skills, legal skills, so many other interdisciplinary knowledge skills. Um, and I think I'll stop here, but, but I think there is a connection to the fascism, communism, and so on and so forth. So, so I guess we have to differentiate a little bit. So, I mean, so on one hand, there were under fascism or communism buildings that are representative buildings that, that embodied the ideology large scale. Um, and I think those are maybe more toxic um, than, um, than the social housing that was built under these regimes. So, so I would say we have, to, we have to look at this in a more nuanced way. <coughs> then I would say 
there were architects who joined the, the resistance and, and they also used their architectural, um, so like on the fascism, uh, and I'm talking specifically about the Viennese context where I'm from, um, the first female architect in my country, Margarita Schütte-Lihotsky, so she joined the resistance and, and she was um, very much an architect um, who, um, yeah, I mean, who fought um, the, the fascist regime and, um, and had a very hard time finding clients after the war. So she would be an example of someone, um, she lived to be 103, so, um, so sh eventually she did build, and she only built for, um, <laughs> for public clients, like schools, kindergartens, social housing. So, so I think the, the question is also, are there still political structures that make welfare possible? And, and what is the role of like the welfare state that, that distributes um, a lot via, via buildings um, that, that are provided for? So, so I think uh, fighting for the existence of welfare as part of an architectural activism could, could be an answer to, to your question. And I think to actively resist, um, so also under a fascist regime, not everyone is a fascist. I mean, so, so it's, it's, there's also people who, who did not vote for such a system or who didn't want it. And you could also be an architect for these people. So I actually come back to what I said at the beginning. You have to research more about your client in order to understand with whom you are entering into a, a relationship that will define the process, the, the, the architecting process, w which then results in what we call a building. So I guess that's what I wanted to say. M maybe it's a bit clearer now. Yeah, hello. Thank you so much for the talk. I found it uh, very inspiring. Um, the concept of care, uh, especially in um, the, the, the architecture, is very interesting. And I think when we look at caring for nature, it becomes uh, a new problem because you um, give the examples of caring in human-human uh, -human interactions, so uh, abled bodies, non-abled bodies. But I'm um, questioning how would we come about voicing nature? How do we go into conversation with nature? Because this introduces, introduces concepts like experts, um, science, and those are all normative assumptions that are being made. So how, for going to the future, in a non-modernist way, how will we interact with this nature? Well, I think we, we need to understand that that mostly we, we extract what we call nature. I mean, mostly we, we consider nature a, a resource ready for um, extraction. Um, and, and architecture is largely based on, on extraction methods. And, and so I think the, the first shift um, has to be to understand that um, the, the more we extract, the less is there. No, the more we extract, from nature, the, the less is left. And, and I think this is precisely what, what was not understood be, before this time that we now call the Anthropocene. So, so there was this notion of endless growth that, that we can extract forever. And I think that's the most important understanding. And I think the other thing is that, um, so today there are many debates. I mean, there's like the, the right to nature, so there are like these philosophical and legal strands that argue that human beings have a right to nature. So, so that's not necessarily extractivist, but, uh, but, uh, but, but nature has to be continued in order for nature to be there for human beings to be enjoyed. But then there are other um, philosophical and, and spiritual, but also legal approaches that talk of the right, they speak of the, and I think that comes closer to your question, they speak of the right of nature. 
so that we need to understand that nature has a right to exist from a non-human centric perspective. And I think this will be extremely hard to, to understand. So how do we relate to nature in a non-human centric perspective? I think one example we can give is that how do we mourn? I mean, so we, we are living in the sixth mass extinction but how do we mourn for all these beings that are being lost? I mean, how, how, do, how do we, there is this new concept of environmental grief, um, so, so that the, the dying of the environment causes people to feel emotional grief and, and pain. And, and there have been studies that, that, again, there is more grief for, for those animals that actually are vertebrate, um, that are closer to us, than for non-vertebrate uh, animals with whom we can have less empathy. So I think unlearning, to answer your question, unlearning and relearning as, as, a, as a very consciousness-raising process um, is, is, is probably something that, I'm, I'm not saying it will happen, <laughs> I would say it would need to happen in order for there to, to, to be changed to, to what we call um, nature. And I think one of the most ironic things is that natural history museums today are sites where we could actually start mourning because some of the, the species that, that haven't even properly been um, got to know by human beings are in the deep storage of natural history museums when they were um, taken from what we call nature in the 18th or 19th century and collected. And, and this is something that I'm currently very interested in. I mean, it's something I'm working on, how, how we can relate to museums as institutions of uh, dead things, um, like colonial and environmental extraction in, in, in a different way. So I think finding sites where people can collectively feel and think what it means to relate to nature in a different way, maybe a very pedagogical approach, would be one of the things um, to think about what you asked about. Um, in context of this week, how do you think the durability of architecture relates um, to the care it provides? So I think durability might be another word for lasting, sustained. Um, yeah, I think la lasting, lasting or durability, I think it's very nice. I like it a lot better than sustainability, which, which has a very no no normative um, understanding to it. I think to think of things as lasting that, that can be used and, and reused and, um, and maybe also um, deconstructed and reconstructed in other ways, I think that's very important. The, the mindset, I think the modern mindset of architecture was to build new things. Um, and, and that was very important. But, but to inhabit what is already here in different ways by means of architecting uh, and making things more durable or longer lasting. So, so not invent new things that will last longer, but actually make the things that are already there lasting longer. I think that, that would be the most important thing to, to do in architecture today. So stop building <laughs> in a certain sense. And, um, or the moratorium on construction that uh, Charlotte uh, Maltea Bart has been organizing with many others. So, so how, to, how to stop construction for a certain period of time in order to, to have um, time and space for the planet to recuperate. Hello. Um, <laughs> so uh, you were talking about learning and unlearning. Um, and more specifically, at one point, you were talking about learning um, as a group of architects to unite, uh, unite against men with a big M and to learn to care. Uh, my question about this is uh, you gave a couple of examples, but on, in the bigger picture, do you believe this is a pace that should be sustained? as it is, like the pace that is going, the, the, the learning to care, 
uh, or there, there is already there's an option to uh, make it faster, to give it a new gear. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that? So, I mean, the, the, optimist, <laughs> the optimist in me um, would say um, th th there are a lot of um, younger people, uh, younger architects, people coming out of architecture school today, but also students who really want to work in architecture differently. And I think this gives a lot of hope. Um, the, the realist, uh, <laughs> I would say, um, so if we talk about um, something that we may want to call feminist realism, is less optimistic that, that this will be a, a large-scale um, change. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't have an answer to your question. But realistically, I, I think it will be very difficult to, to struggle for large-scale change. Thank you for uh, the lecture and uh, the conversation so far. Um, I had a question about this formulation you gave, acknowledging the implications of architecture's implicatedness. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge. It's so much analysis, reconsideration to be done. So I was wondering, uh, is it for you more a matter of history and historical narratives and research, like this retrospective analysis of understanding architecture's implicatedness and assessing the evaluations, you know, uh, suiting it? Or is it in the present for you? Because it in itself, uh, acknowledging, so looking at the now or perhaps the past or even the future, I was wondering, so what's the temporality of that? Yeah, mm -hmm. Since you started with architects' work in the future, but of course they also historicize or have this narrative about the sort of a role in, yeah, in history. So I was wondering, is it, a, is it a chance for you more of history or of, yeah? the present? Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, question. So um, so I borrowed the concept uh, of, of, of implication and implicatedness from a, a memory studies scholar. His name is Michael Rothberg, and he has written a book called The Implicated Subject. And he talks about um, people who are more implicated in certain histories than others. So, so he, he studies the intersection He's a Holocaust studies person, but he's also a decolonial theory person. So he brings these two frameworks together. And, um, and, and I like to borrow this in order to understand that also the built environment in is, is an embodiment, n not just a representation, but an embodiment of certain implications. Um, and I think to study the implicatedness can mean that we also need to learn to inhabit differently. So, so when we know about the, the toxic histories of, of buildings or environments, it can also be a contribution to transformation and emancipation to, to use these buildings in a different way when we look at this hi historically. I think I, I thought about it more in historical terms, but I think from your question we can learn that it's actually a prefigurative um, method or methodology. So, so to understand what are the conditions of production that we are currently implicated in and how are we dealing with them. So, so we are not going to get rid of capitalism anytime soon, but, but how are we going to deal with it in a way that it's less toxic? Um, so I think this is uh, what then would mean that the the notion of implicatedness helps us to understand the responsibility of architectural production in a different way. Are there any more questions? No? Okay, all right. Once again, thank you very much for the lecture. Um,